Hello, everybody. Don't say it in Mount. Drew Lafon, Nisigasun. I'm a member of the Muscogee Lake Cree Nation, located in Treaty 6 territory. I'm also a descendant of the Simp First Nation uh, in Sequetnik territory in British Columbia. I'm currently serving as the president of the Indigenous Bar Association. Uh, EIBA is a nonprofit organization comprised of Indigenous lawyers, judges, academics, and students of, uh, across Canada. Uh, the IBA is participating in this week's summit because our central function and mandate is to advance law, refor law reform and empower Indigenous communities uh, and peoples and to enable them to build their justice systems and governance systems. Uh, and the, the reason why this week's summit is so important and integral uh, for Canada is because violence against Indigenous peoples and within Indigenous communities has tragically become a part of our uh, societal fabric. The reality is that most Indigenous peoples in Canada have suffered some form of personal trauma uh, stemming either directly or indirectly from this violence. Uh, the IBA and other incredible people that you've heard from today, uh, we organized the summit because we believe it's time. Uh, it's time for the federal government to commit to something other than incremental change. There have been 21 uh, reports in the last three decades dealing uh, with Indigenous peoples or violence against Indigenous peoples and their experience with the justice system. Um, it's time for our own leaders to put aside their differences and start to pledge their resources and time to ending violence against Indigenous peoples and within our communities. Uh, and more importantly, it's time for Canadians to ask ourselves, uh, what is it each of us can do individually and as a community to create a different present uh, and a different future uh, where Indigenous peoples or the lives of Indigenous peoples are valid and protected. So with that, um, I'd like to welcome everybody to this session uh, for the afternoon. And I'd like to introduce some of the speakers for today's panel. Um, first, I'd like to introduce our keynote speaker, Dr. Beverly Jacobs, uh, who's a member of the Six Nations of the Grand River Territory. She's uh, the Associate Dean of Faculty of Law at the University of Windsor former president of the Native Women's Association of Canada, and also a member of the Order of Canada, among uh, many other awards and distinctions that she's received. Uh, we're, we're also welcoming, welcoming today as part of our panel, uh, Nigon Sinclair. He's Anishinaabeg assistant pre uh, professor at the University of Manitoba. He's a regular commentator on CTV, CBC, and ATP, APTN. Uh, he's also the author of a recently published book, this place 150 years retold. Another panel speaker is Michelle Audette. Uh, she's one of the five commissioners of the National Inquiry into Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women and Girls. Uh, she ser also served as the president of the Native Women's Association of Canada. Uh, she's an associate deputy, she served as the associate deputy minister of the Ministry of Relations and Citizens uh, and Immigration of, of the Quebec government. And lastly, Paula Marshall will also be serving on our panel. Uh, she is currently acting as the executive director of the Mi'kmaq Legal Support Network. So I'd like to uh, welcome our panel speakers today and welcome everybody who is attending uh, digitally. And we hope, to, we hope to get some comments back from you. And we hope to ensure that you guys have a really good experience this afternoon. Uh, in that regard, I'll pass over the, the microphone and the camera to our first and uh, keynote speaker, Dr. Beverly Jacobs. Thank you. Thank you, Drew, uh, for that introduction. Uh, I'm going to introduce myself in my language first. Scano Sokwego, Giaso, Gawenki, Say, Kayan Gehaga, and Yakwai, Shouda, Hodenashoni. Greetings of peace to all of you. I told you my real name, my Mohawk Bear Clan name is Gawenki, Say, and it means she's visiting. Um, and I'm, I'm in my community now, uh, my little law office at uh, Six Nations. I grew up here in my community and uh, very honored to uh, uh, be invited to present um, keynote today on the Community Calls for Action. And thanks to the organizers for inviting me. And also before I get started, um, I wanted to, um, acknowledge um, the families, uh, not only the families who 
uh, we heard from yesterday and all of the uh, the traumas that um, that they have had to endure as a result of the violence of the colonial system of policing uh, and the system the legal system itself but also acknowledge the families of um, not only missing uh, and murdered indigenous women and girls but also um, the men who have uh, taken the brunt of this as well. So what I what I wanted to uh, talk about today was um, not only the uh, the calls for action and there was um, immediate action points that the organizers have put together. I wanted to focus on uh, community safety. We know that uh, historically uh, we've been dealing with uh, impacts of colonization as a result of of colonial laws and colonial laws being developed to erase us as a people. That's called genocide. Um, we've had to uh, endure a whole colonial legal process that forts, has forced itself um, on Indigenous peoples and Indigenous peoples have been forced into that system. So now we're talking about reform. Um, if we're talking about reform of a system, my mentor, Patricia Montour, the late Patricia Montour, talked about it 30, 40 years ago, about trans transformational change. And transformational change means that there's, you, can, you can see the change, you can feel the change that's occurring and, and we know that the system is actually worse today than it's ever been. So if we're demanding uh, reform, um, then the actors within that system also has to be part of that reform to stop the harm that has continued to hurt and violate and murder our people. And it also means that even within our own Indigenous communities, we have to educate ourselves how that even that system has had an impact on our people, not only as victims uh, of accused, but victims of the system. So even accused um, persons have been, as Indigenous people, are victims of Canada's genocidal system. And so if we're coming to this issue about increasing, how do we increase community safety? Um, we're talking about uh, different ways, different systems, different um, understandings of how our, how our communities work. Um, so we're talking about on reserve. Uh, we're talking about urban centers because over 50% of our people are living in urban centers. And we also know in those urban centers are targets. Um, the targets are indigenous people. On reserve is a whole other, uh, whole other um, processes that, that have to be taken into consideration because there's so many different um, laws, so many different indigenous laws that we come from and our relationship to um, to the land and our our creation stories and um, and how our laws work within our systems. Um, we have never been able to um, develop our own uh, legal systems and uh, I've been um, listening to all the presenters um, since we started, and I know that uh, that Doug White has also acknowledged this, that um, we've never been able to develop our own Indigenous legal systems because that colonial system was enforced. And for how many numbers, hundreds of years, a hundred years at least since we've been forced into the system. And, um, and now coming to a point where we need to develop our own indigenous legal systems. We have our own laws, we still have our elders, we have our knowledge holders, we have our languages, 
We have our speakers, even though they've been impacted in so many different ways, they still exist. Um, one of the issues that had come, uh, or one of the um, immediate action points was to uh, redirect um, public safety funding. So the Department of Public Safety, the Ministry of Public Safety in Canada um, provides funding. Um, there has to be, and this has been a discussion and been something that has been talked about already in many different ways is about resources. If they're, if they're willing to uh, be radical and transformational, that those, fun, that those funds need to come to community in order to develop our own uh, community-based justice and legal systems that recognize our Indigenous laws and also uh, our jurisdiction. One of the other issues that I wanted to talk about, and maybe we can just move to the um, next slide, is this comparison. And of course, I'm Haudenosaunee, so I'm going to talk about uh, Haudenosaunee legal principles. And many of you know that um, where I come from and being Haudenosaunee is that we have our ancient two-row uh, wampum belt, um, Gus Wenta. And so for me, and this is what I do in teaching Indigenous legal orders, is coming to this very um, um, amazing tool that my ancestors had developed in order to um, understand who we are as a people. And that at some, at some point, uh, coming back to this original relationship with the colonizers. So for those who don't know, I'm just going to do a little um, uh, um, understanding of what this is. So this is a first treaty first relationship with my ancestors the Haudenosaunee peoples and leadership with the early colonizers so Gus Wenta means river of life so if you think of this as a as a river of life and that uh, there's three basic principles and white to us is sacredness and understanding that relationship that we have and there are three basic principles peace trust and friendship and that when we have this relationship amongst each other, us, and think about this as a river in our canoe, holds our laws, our customs, our beliefs, our language, everything that holds who we are. In our language, it's and it means our way of being who we are. In the colonizer ship is their laws, their customs, their beliefs, everything that makes them who they are and that we were not gonna interfere in each other's way of life. So this includes our legal systems. This includes our, all of our systems. When we're talking about who we are as a people, it's holistic. There's nothing that changes or puts anything into silos. That when we're practicing our own laws, that it includes um, everything everything and who we are. So in talking about how this colonial system, so in looking at the PowerPoint, the adversarial system is what is included into the colonial ship. This is what was brought into our territories. And so, so this adversarial system is based also on colonial principles. And if we're to talk about our own legal systems, it was, it's holistic, mentally, physically, emotionally, physically, and even our relationship to the land and relationship to creator and all of, all of creation. So if we're to look at this, even from other nations, other nations also had their own ways, their own processes of dealing with conflict. So if we're to put the resources back into our community, it means that we are able to have that jurisdiction to address this and to develop our own systems based on our own laws. And they're holistic. 
So if we move to the next, next slide. So I put, I've been working on this in the community, um, in my community at Six Nations and developing, well, what does this mean? We have all kinds of sources of our laws. And even when I began this journey in my community and asked our language speakers, is there a word for law? And there isn't. It just means our, our way of being. And so that when we have these principles, so our principles based on our laws are, is about balance, is about unconditional love, respect, responsibility, whether it's responsibility to ourselves or to our community, to our clans, to our nations. Integrity, accountability, honesty, peace, good mind, friendship, compassion, uh, benevolence, uh, restoring harmony, enabling healing, giving thanks. And we also have uh, condolence ceremonies um, that help with our grief. Uh, so we need to ensure and this is happening in our communities that we understand grief and what it does to ourselves and our families. And then establishing all healthy relationships. So our laws are about ensuring that we have healthy relationships with, with all of creation. So if we look at criminal legal principles, right, it's based on patriarchy, um, all of these principles of being innocent until proven guilty. The Crown has to prove its case beyond a reasonable doubt that the individual who is accused has to owe a debt to society. Um, principles of retribution, punishment, jail, the adversarialness, like I had mentioned earlier, um, the evidentiary legal rules uh, within the colonial legal system incapacitation, uh, deterrence, re rehabilitation. And one of the, I think one of the um, worst uh, um, processes within the current colonial legal, criminal legal system is that there's no victim representation. So victims of, um, of murder um, and having to go through that legal system, and we've heard, heard it many times from many families, um, not only yesterday, but also the families uh, of missing and murdered Indigenous women. I've been through many different legal um, trials with them, and them having no idea, and then hearing for the first time the, um, the horrific uh, evidence. and. Um, and hearing for the first time how their loved ones were murdered. And that has to be the most trauma, traumatizing experience. So it's important that um, we understand there's a whole different way of thinking. There's a whole different worldview, a whole different um, understanding of how we resolve conflict. And so I think it's important that we understand uh, what, what our intentions are, what my intention is within this system, uh, this colonial system, that if we are demanding reform, we need to understand um, all of the harms that have been caused to our people. But, but I also think that if we're going to abolish, so there's been calls to abolish jails, there's been calls to abolish uh, policing. So what does that mean if we're going to abolish those? It means that we need to ensure that we have a process in our communities to address any harms that have been done. And so the, yes, this is a longer term and a longer process in order to understand how to resolve conflict and that we have so many different nations across Turtle Island. Um, but the, that's where the resources need to be um, directed in order, to, in order for us to be self-determined. Um, next slide. So this is part of my PhD. Um, 
and looking at um, our laws and um, and how actually how resource development has had an impact uh, on our laws. Um, and so that's on the global picture and the environmental damage that it's done to our territories and lands and waters. And that when I interviewed our elders and knowledge holders and they told, they said to me that when we practice our own laws, this is what makes us healthy. This is what helps us to be holistically healthy. And also this is what self-determination is. So if we're to enable ourselves to develop systems, whether it's health, justice, social, um, education, uh, this is our self-determination and that when we practice our own laws, so that means we need to know what that is. You know, a lot of the impacts in our communities is that, that was, that's been lost in some families. And so in order for us to come together, we have to respect each other. That's a basic principle of our law. And to be able to come together and have those uh, conversations about what that means. Um, and so, and I wanna quote, this is from Commissioner Buller uh, in her presentation, said that we need to empower our own communities to make change. And so in order to empower our communities and our people and our communities, we have to heal. We have to heal from all of that trauma and hurt and pain, not only from the colonial Canadian genocidal policies, but also um, how that's been transferred even in our own communities. Because even if we do have community policing, and that has been the conversation, if our own people don't trust our own policing, it's not gonna work. So there has to be healing, there has to be trust, there has to be all of those basic principles within our own laws to have an understanding of what it means to develop our own. And I, I believe that that's what, um, what needs to occur. Next slide. So, Again, thank you for the opportunity to speak to you today. And this again is one of, you know, one of our principles, one of our teachings about thinking uh, seven generations ahead and that every, every decision uh, and how we make those decisions in this lifetime is critical for our future generations. And that every decision, so, so the actual decisions that we make today, what decisions that we make today, everything that we think about um, in this lifetime is critical for, for our future generations. And I, and I truly follow that. Every decision that I make, I think about how that has an impact on my great, 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 great great grandchildren um, and I really um, I really follow that so again thank you Yawa thank you for the opportunity to to speak today thank you very much for that wisdom there uh, Dr. Jacobs uh, and we'll save the questions until after all the present, uh, presentations have occurred, but uh, thank you very much. And that was very, very insightful. And I'm sure a lot of people have, have thoughts following hearing your presentation. I'd like to invite uh, Negan Sinclair to, to speak next and uh, looking forward certainly to what you have to say on this topic. So, uh, okay, can you hear me fine? Are we good? Okay, so bonjour to the main magazine. Nigan we have been doing the cast name of the show. Them, ni men when them oh my I N. Mi gwech ki wait na kwe poaba na jawa na kamino ab ipash kashkano. It's a pleasure to be here. It's a pleasure to uh, share some space with you. I'm coming to you all the way from Treaty One territory, and uh, I'm right here uh, looking at a number of things on my screen. Um, I've got. Uh, Few things that I want to share with you about some things. Um, 
I haven't quite been able to uh, share some of the images, so I'm just going to draw your attention to uh, if you have two things uh, on your computer screen or if you can look them up if you have a computer screen and you want to open them up to. I'll be referring to some of the TRC calls to action in the United Nations Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous People. So I'll be referring to some of those things. So if you want to look those up as I go along. Um, but I am not a lawyer. So unlike, <laughs> unlike many people from this summit, uh, I don't pretend to be a lawyer. I don't... Uh, you know, I, I don't imagine that I'm a lawyer. Uh, I can, my, uh, my father, who I'm sure most of you know, Senator Murray Sinclair, is still waiting for me to become a lawyer. But <laughs> in fact, he says to me a few times, he says, uh, uh, he's waiting for me to get a real job. But I'm, I'm a professor in Native Studies at the University of Manitoba. Uh, and I'm also a columnist with the Winnipeg Free Press. And I do a number of other jobs within the community here on Treaty 1 territory. I'm the curator of Indigenous Development at the Forks National Historical Site. I'm also the uh, in Indigenous curator at the Royal Aviation Museum, which is, yes, airplanes going to the north. We're just uh, making a new museum right now. And I also work with child welfare agencies throughout the city and school divisions. So I particularly work with uh, Pegwis Child, child and Family Services, which is what, where I'm from. I'm a member of Pegwis First Nation. And, uh, and I also work with school divisions all across the country, written curriculums and so on. So like I said, I don't pretend to be a lawyer, but uh, here's how, even if I try to avoid law or talking about law, um, uh, it, it comes at me. Uh, I, uh, I was on a uh, national uh, television program recently, uh, a talk show uh, on CBC, and uh, it was myself and a former leader of a federal party uh, who shall remain nameless. Uh, however, you can probably figure out who it might be. Um, and uh, we were talking about the uh, situation of, at Wet'suwet'en and the, uh, the current imposition of the RCMP on the rights of the Wet'suwet'en people, particularly in relation to the ignoring of their hereditary chiefs and the just absolute ignorance and denial of uh, the Delgamau decision and also Section 35 in terms of any consultation whatsoever with the community. And I said uh, at that time, and I'll continue to say it again, particularly involving the denial of the appeal, um, and then the further denial of the appeals in, in terms of the Trans Mountain Pipeline extension is that can, Canadian courts make Canadian decisions, period. There is no other ways to conceive of Canadian court systems that make any other decisions other than in the most best favor for Canadian interests. And what I mean by that is even when the courts do make a decision, it's forcing our rights as a people, our rights as nations, our particular sovereignty into a Canadian context in which is, it is understood by Canadian frameworks. That is the exact issue that Bev was speaking about in her, in her keynote, which is that it then gets forced into an adversarial framework where Indigenous peoples not only get framed as ad adverse to Indigenous uh, Canadian interests, but that Indigenous rights, Indigenous sovereignties, Indigenous nationhood uh, most often gets posited as the problem of the country. And that's as simple as I can make it for describing the, the central issue of law within the country is that um, I'm someone who works with the Truth and Reconciliation Commission report uh, and advocating for the 94 calls to action and the implementation throughout all spheres of society. So I work with almost everybody within Treaty 1 territory. And I would say that, and without any disrespect to anyone else in the country, um, we, there's a reason why the uh, National Center for Truth and Reconciliation is located here. There's a reason why the Truth and Reconciliation Commission offices are here is because I think Manitoba, Treaty 1 territory in particular, and I may, but may be biased, but I think Treaty 1 particularly, is uh, actively engaged in a process in which they're trying to both understand and then implement and engage the Truth and Reconciliation Commission calls to action on a broad scale. And it's not that that isn't happening elsewhere. It's just that uh, the, the amount of population alone in Manitoba, approximately 20% of the population here on the ground in Manitoba, but also Treaty 1 territory, southern Manitoba, uh, is Indigenous. 20%. That means one out of every five people have are a status Indian or a member of the Métis Federation or they're a member of an Inuit uh, government or they're a member of an Inuit community. That's not even in talking about the self-declared Indigenous peoples within this place. What that means is that every single person in our community is either living beside, working beside, or is married to an Indigenous person. The reality is, is that we are in this situation together, and you cannot deny it, unlike places, other places in the country where people like to pretend that Indigenous laws don't exist. You cannot do that 
in Treaty 1 because it is impossible. Uh, we, for example, uh, have uh, the situation involving the Capyong Barracks here in the city, which is a land claim that's owed to Treaty 1 First Nations. Uh, it's in the richest area of Winnipeg, and it has been after 12 years of fighting uh, the Harper government. Uh, finally, the Trudeau government then agreed no longer to fight a useless battle. It was a waste of taxpayer dollars, $45 million of taxpayer dollars, and then was handed over to Treaty 1 First Nations and will represent the largest economic development project in the city. There is, while every other corporation in Manitoba is leaving, going bankrupt or then taking off like uh, national, international conglomerates, corporations who come here, exploit, take the money from our place and then go elsewhere. First Nations are the number one economic producer and also the number one economic investor because we live here. This is our home territory. We are constantly and consistently engaged with the laws of the province. Therefore, we are always at the table. And if not at the table, we march until we are at the table. And that is the big challenge in our community. So you see several different innovations within this place. And one of them is within the TRC calls to action. Um, um, I have, a, you know, like approximately 17 of the 94 calls to action are directly addressing justice. And uh, the one that I work the most on is number 28, which is around uh, law schools tra and training. Uh, but the TRC calls to action are meant to be what Bev was speaking about, which is a uh, non-adversarial point of building relationships. And we might call that reconciliation, but really what it is, is it's about truth telling and that engagement in relationship building. So reconciliation is about two elements. The first is, is about speaking the truth and understanding the truth. And then the second is, is that enacting that truth and living that truth. So that is, what the pro that is what the biggest challenge of the country is, is that I think in most elements of Canadian society, truth is seen as um, something adversarial to the Canadian project. And in most, most cases involving Indigenous truth, it is. Uh, we've been denied, erased, marginalized. That is where we get into conversations around genocide. But upon engaging that truth, then enacting that truth is the biggest challenge of all. And that's where you get into hiring practices, policies, procedures, practices. That is the hard work. That's why it is crucially important that we don't just make territorial acknowledgements, but we actually talk about returning the land. Because returning the land is where you enact truth. Truth is just simply saying the territorial acknowledgement. So if we were to talk about rights in all of this, or a law, for example, is what the TRC invites us to do. That's 17 of the 94 calls to action. That's just in terms of justice. That means that we have to look at prisons differently. Or we have to uh, you know, look at the, the, the real possibility is that prisons are a problem. The over-incarceration rate as being the most biggest manifestation. The justice system is a problem. The uh, laws involving land, um, still being seen as empty or as terra nullius, those are a problem. And if we abolish those, that's where we get into the enacting. But the, what will replace it or what will engage it is the real challenge of what uh, Bev is talking about. And that's when we start talking about our clans. And that's when we start talking about the enactments of our principles and our traditions and our leadership. And the real problem, I think, is that we are so fundamentally used to the idea of imposed governance and law upon us that it is very difficult for us to see outside of those systems, for instance, the chief and council system. We have real difficulty in, we think that the chief and council system was something that we had as nations and we did not. Um, our, our council systems were based on our clans and our relationships of our governance systems in which our methods, our pr principles, our responsibility, our ethics had built what, uh, a multitude of what we often refer to as the Ogamok, which would be like understanding that there is no such thing as one chief ever. There is no chief, one chief ever in any Indigenous community anywhere. There is multiple levels of leadership and they're most often built around matriarchies. They're both, most likely built around grandmothers on most not all nations of course are the same but understanding that there is no such thing as the chief and council model so therefore for us to think outside of that is the biggest challenge of all because there are um, systemic barriers in place to ensure that we don't have those now that's where the trc calls to action particularly number 25 through 44 come in um, and that's also the biggest TRC calls that call to action, which is the implementation of the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. Now, the, uh, the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, um, the, the one that most addresses laws is Article 27, which says that our law, our legal systems have to be recognized as on par or 
um, at, in cooperation or in partnership with the state laws in which we participate within. The issue is, is where, does, where do we get with um, when there are uh, collisions, like fundamental collisions, like terra nullius is probably the best example of that, the notion that the land is empty or that the land is full. And those two things, I think, are the basis between Western law and Indigenous law as being two different ways of perceiving property. And those kind of concepts are where uh, truth telling is valuable, but then uh, understanding that there might be the possibility, uh, and I think this is probably the most valuable thing that Indigenous storytellers remind us, is that two truths can operate in the same place. And that may be something that be that is very that is a different thing to difficult thing to reconcile, because what would it look like if two truths can operate in the same place? Well, some might call that compromise. Others might call it reconciliation. I might call it living together in partnership. And that means that we may have to give and take at some point in order to understand what does that look like. And it also might be the complicatedness of living uh, in worlds in which we are um, at times, while we may want to favor our laws as the only things, it may be that we may have to look at the ways in our laws and operate in partnerships with others, which, oh, by the way, is our creation story. The number one thing that when we tell our creation stories is that our creation stories are meant to fit with other creation stories throughout creation. There is no solid unitary creation story and that we're, we're in a constant series of relationship building mechanisms forever. Now, however, this is where uh, I want to uh, end off my 10 minutes by talking talking a little bit about um, how do you deal with power systems which refuse to acknowledge you or to recognize you. Uh, that is the biggest challenge I think that laws are going to face because as I mentioned before as I started off this presentation, Canadian courts make Canadian decisions, period. And we can't accept, we can't uh, expect Canadian courts to ever make decisions in our favor because the Canadian courts were only working within Canadian law and occasionally we may get, may get a Delgamau decision which recognizes something pre-Canadian law, but is almost undefinable in the Canadian system. So therefore, what does that look like? Well, it may just be that we have to enact that ourselves. And am I talking about civil disobedience? Yes. Am I talking about protests and marches? Yes. But what I'm talking about is some of the work that we're doing in Treaty 1 territory, which I think is the most, some of the most important um, legal work, but it's also work in child welfare, and it's also work that enacting sovereignty within a space that may have the most draconian and brutal uh, violence against us. Now, I work with uh, a system with a group of people called the Mama Bear Clan uh, here in the city, and we have two bear clans here in Winnipeg. We have the Bear Clan, which is much larger known. It's driven, it's a, it's driven through a, an individual called James Favel, um, uh, it's a uh, system that's been going since the 1970s, a community patrol. Um, and it's been a very important work that's been in the city for peace and justice. But the Mama Bear Clan, which is run through the North Point Douglas Women's Center, which uh, we have been running now for, for a number of years. I've only been on for you know five, six months. But the Mama Bear Clan has been a, a, a process that women have developed within our city. Um, indigenous women who have, uh, and our motto is uh, guided by women, supported by men. And the work that we're doing in the city is we're patrolling the streets, assisting our relatives who are suffering, uh, but also that we provide the same services the Bear Clan Patrol offers, which is uh, protection services, uh, people assisting services who are people in trauma and distress. But all of that work goes into uh, what Bev was speaking about, which is the whole ass holistic engagement of resistance, but also enactment of revitalization, or uh, we might call it recovery, or growth, or sovereignty of our communities in relation to the most draconian of circumstances, regardless of power dynamics. Uh, the bottom line of it is, is that no, no matter the powers of the police, no matter the powers of the justice system, of the lawyers, is that we continue to march regardless of the, uh, the systems that seek to uh, enact their, its violence against us. And, and this is enacted most regularly with our relatives on the streets who uh, during the COVID pandemic over the past three months, uh, the drug use on, in Winnipeg has exponentially increased. Approximately 15% of needle drug use and then 25% of alcohol drug use, uh, alcohol use on our streets. And that's predominantly because when you take a traumatized people who are experiencing uh, great violence and dispossession, 
and then you add a trauma of a pandemic on that, then you exponentially create more and more trauma to the case of, uh, while other people, of course, experiences trauma as well, no one experiences it more than Indigenous peoples in the streets of Winnipeg. And so we've taken a frontline approach that we continue to, to uh, patrol during the pandemic um, with safety and health measures in place. But what we noticed was that the drug use, the needle use was exponentially increased. And, and just one night alone, I, I myself picked up 300 needles just in a, in a one half city block radius, which we had never done before. So what we've been doing is we've been enacting uh, methods of kindness for our relatives. And most of our patrols involve simply speaking with people, listening with people, asking, offering smudges for people, and then enacting uh, genuine instances of gift giving with relatives. And that may involve food, that may involve water, may involve sunscreen or bug spray, or but most often it, it represents the same kind of principles that we use within the lodge, within our Medewa Ghaning which is our gift giving procedures, which is what we call our baggage and none, our offerings of our offerings of gifts in the process of relationship making. And that has created a fostering of relationships within those spaces. So now that now we're able to enact uh, issues, uh, you know, solutions for trauma, solutions for injustice and violence, solutions for um, People, for example, who are, uh, you know, getting into, uh, want to get out of, in, out of addictions, for example. The, the frontline defense for our people may not be the courts, it may not be education, and it may not be even culture and language, because those things cannot be heard when people are currently existing trauma. When we get them into a position where the systemic barriers uh, are, they can see a way out of those systemic barriers, aka the courts, the education system, uh, justice, uh, then we can get to a point in which we can enact revitalization. And that may be the most important truth of all, is that we just have to do it. We just have to enact our laws. We just have to live them. And if that means we're going to be called civil disobedience, fine. If that means we're going to be called problems, we're going to be fine. If that means we're going to have to break laws in relation to the Canadian courts, which always make Canadian decisions. The, the fight for justice is just, and we will continue in, in the long game to be able to enact our decisions. And I only know that because, you know, when I was a young boy, I watched my dad go to courts that were a wall of whiteness. Uh, I was sitting in the back, I'd read my comic books and watch my dad in court, and he was the only other Indigenous person other than the accused. In fact, most times judges mistook my dad for the accused. And looking at it now, we have Indigenous peoples within the system However, uh, much more pivotally, those Indigenous peoples within the system have been supported by Indigenous communities and peoples who have fought for our cultures and traditions, which have enacted themselves, which then affects the peoples working within those systems. It is not a matter of inclusion. It's a matter of supporting our people to be adequately supported in that system in order for them to enact our, our laws, our principles within those systems. But then most importantly, to just enact our laws, no matter regardless of the laws and the systems in place. So I say huge miigwech. Thank you very much for having me and I'll uh, look forward to hearing from the other panelists. Thank you, Nigon. And certainly some important words out of you. And I'll, I, I think I couldn't agree more. And you had a comment at the beginning there that you, you're you speaking not from the perspective of a lawyer or somebody with legal training, although you do come, come from stock of one of the most uh, famous Indigenous lawyers in Canadian history. But there, there's certainly something to be said about your words. And lawyers all the time are thinking about some of the issues that you raised, and in particular, the internalization. Um, of some of the trauma that's been imposed on us and how it's now it's now being portrayed and it's now being enacted through our colonialized governance systems and through our, our hurtful experiences that we continue to inflict upon one another uh, as Indigenous peoples. And uh, certainly that's something that it's, it's an ongoing theme that we want to have addressed and it's something that we're going to have to overcome. And I do agree that law is a lived experience and law uh, of Indigenous peoples will eventually, it will come to the surface and it will find its expression in lived experiences. The issue is going to be when those laws come into conflict with uh, Canadian federal and provincial laws and that's that's where the real battle and where the real where the real fight's going to be and that's where the legal profession, uh, particularly those uh, within the IBA, are always going to be there uh, to support and uh, to hear those concerns and I'd like to thank you for your time. Um, stay online because we'll we'll direct any questions that we get uh, during the next presentation to you as well 
So thank you very much, Nigon. That was was very insightful. Uh, our next speaker, Michelle Audet, I'd like to uh, invite you uh, to speak next, and uh, the microphone is yours. Parfait, merci beaucoup. Pour que sinon, t'es bien de m'aider pour vous garder de nous. Au dé Québec, ne t'inquiète et nous ne pourrons pas tout. One that at the Quebec, Malaisit Abenaki, and all of us. So I was uh, saying in Inu. Uh, I'm not used to do conferences through this uh, technology and even I don't speak English anymore so I might be rusted or I might create new words but there's so many lawyers I'm sure I'll be well defended or represented uh, or people that can uh, write to me I mean uh, maybe it's what you wanted to say in my language, I was uh, saying thank you to the many nations that are welcoming us here, our family in uh, so Quebec, it's an Inu word in our language. It means that we were so awesome when the white people came from uh, the other side. Uh, we said to them, come back from your boat so you can get off from your boat. But it seems it's not well thought in the school still today in 2020. Uh, maybe in your bio about me or the bio about me, uh, there's something very, very, very important that why I wake up every day and why I, I do things uh, as, uh, with heart and passion. It's for my five children and my two granddaughters, Awastia, Sheshka, Yokwase, Wapen, and Amun, and of course, uh, my granddaughter who lives in Chilliwack and my other daughter granddaughter who lives at, here now so very blessed and very blessed also that in one of our uh, legend uh, our ch children will decide their stars in the sky will decide who is the parent so I'm glad they choose me and I have to honor this every day but they also said many times that it is hard to have a parent that is rarely at home before COVID, of course. And when I brought them to a demonstration or Ottawa uh, to, uh, you know, for a walk or for the inquiry, they quickly understood that in, in what I do, I'm just a tool, I'm just a person, a human being among thousands of people who were there way before me and today to make a small change or a huge one with a, within a system that it doesn't belong to us, a system that is imposed on us and that will affect us for so many decades. Then you're all expert, you, you, you know that. And I wanna say thank you uh, to Dr. Bev, Bev Jacobs who works so hard uh, in her life and as a family member and as a strong leader to make sure that this country called Canada will have one day uh, an inquiry. Perfectly non-perfect, of course, uh, but many women like Bev uh, made sure that Canada will be forced to have this inquiry. And thank you for families, survivors, allies, and people from many, many places uh, around the world, I would say, who uh, made sure that this country one day will shake and hear the truth. And the truth that came from fears, from anger, from passion, from voices that never spoke before, from people that were very strong and vocal on the street or through media to tell their truth. And of course, to create, I would say, uh, a chapter where finally we will available uh, make sure that their truth will be used now uh, in the court system or the, the justice system and at the international community, of course. So, merci, miigwech, nishka maintenant. And coming from uh, the Inu nation, and my dad is Quebecois, I was and still able to connect with my community, and my community is way up north, uh, depending who we see the north, to the Inuit, it's not that north, but for me it is. Where summer, it's only two weeks near Schifferville and Mushwanapi. And from there, this is where uh, I was able to save my life 
and to reconnect and find that balance where the colonial system, education, how we were treated and how we were put in place or managed to, to suffer, uh, it was a place for me to say enough is enough. And during that inquiry, um, it was so powerful to hear people that never spoke for 40 years kept, kept their sufferance, their, 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 what happened to them. They were removed from a territory, forced to go to another place. Uh, their children were taken away. Uh, thanks for the work of the uh, commission on this, the uh, Truth and Reconciliation Commission and their work to bring also that truth of how many our children were taking away to residential schools and a priest would rape them in the community uh, and then that same family as an example uh, would uh, be removed and then changed to another place their children are taken and if they challenge because they didn't have any lawyers in the 60s and 70s they would believe in their rights to be Inu or Tekemek or that nation and from that territory. And the government will send some priests and some people from the Hudson Bay and say, you have to make sure that they have no food. So they will be, you know, in hunger. Je sais pas là, affamé, and we can manipulate them. So with the National Inquiry, we were able to find those truth or evidence and fact and see that's a form of genocide, an official one form of genocide. So with that, even myself as a mom, grandmother or militant, I was learning so much, learning from the best teachers, the best uh, people who, from their words or reaction or their ceremony, and also how they criticized the work we did or embrace uh, the work we did. The best teaching was that, oh my God, even me who thought, who went to university, I never finished university, but I went there a couple of years in Montreal, that I didn't know my history, my, my history as a new woman, but also the indigenous history here in Canada. Um, yes, I can see or I can know some of it, a piece of it, but across Canada, learning from all that expertise, the knowledge keepers, it was like, oh my God, this is it. We have to continue the work of many uh, people of many, uh, from many territories that force or try or went on hunger strike or made some barricades or went to court, went to the UN, went everywhere where they can move and shake the place or the, uh, the moment to make sure that we take back the control of, uh, or that relationship that we have with our own territories, land and culture. And with that traveling and receiving all those truth and message from families, it was obvious for me, obvious, 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 how our mental health is so broken, broken, and it was calculated, we know that how our spiritual uh, health or physical, mental, and emotional is still broken today. Is still So thanks for all the people who are helping us to walk and to bring back our shoulder more, you know, as to be a, a proud person or a proud nation. And uh, also the education. Uh, I'm blessed today. I worked three days at Laval University to bring to that space the call for justice, the call for action, the Royal Commission uh, recommendation, and many, many other reports to remind this space that they are creating leaders of today and tomorrow, but with the same colonial approach or way of thinking. They're, putting, they're creating the next generation of lawyers or judges or doctors or nurses and all of that. And they have no clue about us. And then we're wondering, oh, racism? Systemic uh, racism? Yeah, right, it doesn't exist in Quebec, apparently. So this is where, for me, the gift that we receive from families, it just tell me that what you do, all of you, 
and many other people is so important that we need to be everywhere. We need to push as much as we can. Sometimes it's slow, sometimes it's fast, but the education and the mental health or the mental, the spiritual, physical, and emotional is for me the top, top, top priority. And how a nation or a community will think that this is what I think it's the best for me and my people. We have to honor that. We have to respect that. And with COVID, another blessing, I'm capable to support uh, people who works for the Inu Nation and drugs. Or I think, uh, Negan, you mentioned that, how vulnerable we were uh, before COVID and more with COVID. It's scary how people or groups can use that the vulnerability of our people and to see how slow a government or many government the provincial government will react or stay the same it's just what happened when they arrived and it's still the same today in 2020 so yes we need people in that system the legal system even if it's not ours and i know we're not going to be able to change it in one night but you will be able to make us win or to make us uh, challenge and shake uh, the province or the territory or the, the the federal government about who we were and who we are today it's expensive it's long but it's a week of like many, many, many other ways of. And the indigenous people I found when I was traveling, the voice from the North, the Inuit or the people who lives in the North, and I, you can tell I have a strong French accent, the indigenous in this region who the second language is French, uh, we, we are still missing or isolated from important movement that exists in Winnipeg or across Canada and we have so much to learn from you we have so much but that barrier make us not you know it doesn't help us and if we had people like you in Quebec very very vocal very powerful I'm sure the logo logo government or the CAC government would would do things differently but because i don't know inu nation a tikemek anishinaabe the people who speak french as second language did not demonstrate like the rest of canada on many many issues why it's something that we could look and study but there is that approach where we we don't make enough pressure and stress uh, the people who decide without us on our on our beha behalf and uh, just to say again those voices those tears and hope for me for the rest of my life i'm gonna have to honor it honor it as much as i can and i know i'm not naive uh 10 000 recommendation were proposed by the witnesses, the expert, the knowledge keeper, people from the community, people that never shared their truth before, or a strong advocate who uh, made sure that they would go through this uh, colonial uh, system, the national inquiry, because it wasn't our uh, approach, let's let be honest, but it was to make sure. And the quote for me that was very, very, very powerful, it's, you need to fight the system within the system. And my mom is from the, the territory where she doesn't believe in that colonial system, but she agreed during a ceremony to let me go and say, I'm not sure you're going to win, but if those women can use you as a tool and advance and the men also, and if it's only five of them or hundreds of them, make sure that it's not one shot because you were a commissioner, but it has to stay for the rest of your life. So in that sweat, that ceremony, I said to her and to my children, 
I will try. Sometimes I'm powerful. Sometimes I'm almost dead. Not dead, but huh, because it's huge. But it's nice to know that there's so many, so many of powerful women and men across Canada in different fields, different places are making a chapter or making history to remind who we were and who we are. So in my community and many other community out here right now, uh, they don't know. We don't know who we were before. The oral tradition is very important. And yes, the school has to change, but us too, we need to revive that, bring this back. And when we ask for support, of course, Quebec or Ottawa, it seems forever, or it's low, or it's, it's no, it's a no, or it's too slow. And when you hear families that says, I just want to speak, I just want to feel safe, I just want to know what happened. I just want somebody or the institution to explain to me, I'm not stupid. I deserve that. This is my right. And not because I don't have the money or not because I don't have the words or the, that language and that culture. Why should I be treated differently? So I will try again and again to remind in my prayers that maybe we don't have, we won't have the, the answer, but when we have people that knows how to fight within the system, maybe it's something that can feel good inside of our heart. So congratulations and good for your work. And on my end, uh, in my new pair of moccasin, I do it with love. Merci. Merci in French. Thank you. Thank you for that, Michelle. And uh, thank you for your insights on um, your, your views on change within the system uh, as opposed to being uh, outside of the system. And i uh, just like to add to that. There was uh, uh, an advisor of mine, the late Patricia Montour, I once asked her that very question, is it, some, is it worth changing, uh, trying to change an institution from within and her wise response at the time was change is change and all change given the current circumstances is good. Um, so that's, thank you very much. And that's that reaffirms that, that wisdom that was passed along all those years ago. Um, lastly, our, our final speaker on the panel today, I'd like to invite Paula Marshall. So uh, take it away, Paula. Okay, thank you. Um, very intimidating today to speak to you, especially since I'm last of the day, but also from my uh, esteemed co-panelists all day. It was a pleasure listening to you and it was very informative. Uh, well, Alio, I'm here from Mi'kma'ki in Nova Scotia. I too am not a lawyer or an academic. My experience is community programs and responding to the first voice in our communities. Um, the evolution of what is known as the Mi'kmaq Legal Support Network in Nova Scotia almost be began almost 20 years ago in response to many of the social and political changes that were happening in our province and again in Canada, the legal actions and the treatment of um, Indigenous people. As everybody is aware, Nova Scotia has a well-documented history of systemic racism within our Mi'kmaq community and the African Nova Scotian community as well, um, as proven by the 1971 wrongful conviction of Donald Marshall Jr. in the death of Sandy Seal. As a result of that case, in 1990, there was the Royal Commission report on the Donald Marshall um, inquiry, and that set the stage for Mi'kmaq and Aboriginal representation and participation in legal matters here in Nova Scotia. The report identified the fundamental problem was the difference between the cultural makeup of the Mi'kmaq and the justice system. Then there were two more reports that followed in 1991, the Aboriginal Peoples and Criminal Justice by the Law Reform and the Justice System and, of, and Aboriginal People with the Aboriginal Justice Inquiry in Manitoba. They were both released in 91 and they both supported the establishment of an Aboriginal justice system where Aboriginal people would exercise control and administration over governing justice systems and also how it would be defined. 
In 92, we had federal governments begin to reorganize Native justice delivery programs and responsibility was beginning to be transferred from Indian Affairs to other federal programs like Department of Justice. 96, we had RCAP, which also emphasized the need to develop um, more autonomy um, in justice. Uh, recommendation number 15, uh, maybe one of my favorites, uh, it says that the commission recommends in the allocation of financial resources and greater priority be given to providing a secure, secure financial base for the development and implementation of Aboriginal justice systems. Here we are in 2020. MLSN is a um, Aboriginal or Indigenous justice organization that provides justice support programs for um, all Indigenous people in Nova Scotia, and we are not funded. We run on a grant from the province of Nova Scotia and in min dollars of our programs. And that really limits the growth and our ability to take on new challenges and what priorities we have. We don't have the time, money, or human resources to take that on. Our court worker program and our customary law program are well funded, but our bail program, GLADU, Victim Support Services, and our reintegration program for um, uh, Indigenous federal offenders, they're all underfunded. Here in Nova Scotia in 2016, in remand was 8.8% women and 23% of men. In all of our remand institutions here in uh, Nova Scotia Correctional Facilities, our population is only 5.7. So our people are overrepresented in the jails in the remand level, not just as in serving time. Uh, if we're looking at the Cape Breton Correctional Facility, which is where the majority of our um, Indigenous population is in the province, we're at about 20 to 25 percent um, in that facility. Parole and uh, federal offenders, our people when they go into jails, they are classified as high risk, um, so they get put into maximum. We have very few people that are people that get classified as minimum. Our Indigenous people are less likely to get parole, and if they do get parole, it's day parole. And even in a solitary confinement, or what they now call the structured intervention units, we're at Indigenous people make up 31% of the people that are in um, the structured intervention units. And um, like other parts of Canada, we suffer here in Nova Scotia from over-policing. Community members are reluctant to call the police. We have our own tragic cases here in our province in Nova Scotia as well. We have the John Simon case, and he was killed in 2008 after police officers responded to a 911 call about a domestic dispute. And then in 2009, Truro Police, according to an inquiry, didn't properly monitor Victoria Paul, who suffered a fatal stroke while in their custody. She was left lying on a cement floor in her own urine for four hours, according to the inquiry. First Nations policing, when we review the literature, there's an absence of provincial legislation providing the establishment and regulation of Aboriginal police services. There's insufficient and inequitable funding. When we had the Unamagi Tribal Police, five communities were given a million dollars to um, run a detachment for in all five communities. When the funding wasn't um, available and it was shown to be a lack of resources, uh, the government gave the um, RCMP a million dollars just for policing one community and provided them with all of the bells and whistles of programs and equipment. It's long been recognized that in First Nations communities, we have higher times than national average of um, violence and assault. Here in this particular detachment in Eskasoni, they can, they often say they have the highest violence rate of any detachment this side of Montreal. Um, Aboriginal people are more at risk to be victimized. 37% of Aboriginal people self-reported being a victim of crime. And 74% are self-reported. Aboriginal women, we know, are three times more likely to report being a, viol um, a victim of spousal violence. What do we know about over policing in Nova Scotia or policing in Nova Scotia? We know that there's over policing of black and indigenous people. 
uh, we see that in our communities. And Halifax has recently been in the news for uh, random street checks on uh, people of minority. We also know that Aboriginal perceptions, there's a lack of understanding and sensitivity to Aboriginal culture by the non-Aboriginal police officers. We're aware of programs, but they're insufficient. There's a recruitment is low for RCMP. We have four officers who um, retire and we don't have anybody to take their place. So why is it our people not, you know, being a part of the system? We also lack preventative patrol and crime prevention programs in many of our communities, uh, especially where we see that we need family violence and substance abuse program. People report unnecessary roughness. We are told by our community members that it's a reactive approach to policing. But yet, on the other side, it's reflected by um, irregular police presence and a poor response time when we have uh, no police presence in that particular community, they have to travel in. We also know the victims are less likely to report, they're less likely to testify, and we know that here in our province that uh, the community committees or for the uh, community transfer agreements for um, RCMP are non-existent or not functioning. Dr. Jay McMillan in 2011 did um, a research project calling Dressing Family Violence. And what she talked about is that access to justice is a significant problem for Indigenous victims and Mi'kmaq people. And they're less likely to turn to the Canadian legal system or mainstream services because of general mistrust. Where does this mistrust come to? Well, we know that there's a significant inadequacies of the legal system to meet our needs so due to systemic discrimination. We know that that discrimination and, and marginalization is across race and class and poverty, um, our abilities. We know that the perception of the criminal legal system is seen as an institution of colonial oppression. Not to mention how long it takes to process charges. Sometimes we're seeing years before we see a case to its conclusion. We have zero tolerance policies that result in counter charges, which may mean that a woman may lose her house or lose her children because of these counter charges. We have limited culturally appropriate options in court. We have pro-charge, pro-incarceration policies that are problematic when it comes to policing relationships in our communities. We also know that the high-risk assessment tools are culturally inappropriate. They don't address what's happening in our own communities. Our community members feel that there's inadequate sentences and that jail is not effective as a deterrent. We also know that our community members uh, deal with poverty and going to court outside of our communities and into cities that, you know, or community uh, half an, an hour away is going to have a social cost and a financial cost. So <clears throat> overwhelmingly, what uh, Dr. McKinley came across is that poverty, addiction, and culture loss are the most significant factors that perpetuate violence. But to clarify this, it's not the act of violence that's perceived as normal. What's perceived as, as the problem, it's the helplessness. It's the patterns of continued abuse that are linked with substance and abuse and poverty. And that there's a lack of effective intervention, lack of access to the system, and even the inability of the system to provide adequate justice. That's what people are feeling the, the distance from. They're feeling it, it's too far away from, these, from their culture. This is what I'm told the lived experience of, uh, lived experiences of our people are. This is what they're telling us is normal. So for change to occur, this tension with recent and past events, that it has to be in the mind of Canadian societies. We know the way it is, but we need our Canadian allies to also understand that it cannot be just the way it is. In these most recent cases with Colton Bushy, Brady Francis, Tina Fontaine, Cindy Cladu, Chantel Moore, Rodney Levi, their legacy has to be the catalyst for change. Now, the, the work that this summit is doing and other work that's being done at local levels will help to mobilize us and mobilize the Indigenous community so that we can start to seek out what changes need to be made. But we need to listen to communities. 
we need to listen to the families who've been hurt. Because as the other speaker said today, we have the answers, we know what the problems are. What our communities are saying is that diversity is important. There's no one size fits all, not across Canada, not even within our provinces. There's so many regional differences. They also believe that justice should be consistent and adaptable, and that there has to be continuity as there were in our legal traditions. So in our Mi'kmaq language, there's no word for culpability, no word for guilt, there's no word for judging. What customary law is based on is msidnogma, all my relations. And that indicates a collective responsibility for our actions. Justice concepts or customary laws aren't a list of rules, but rather uh, a list of behaviors. And social control is rested in kinship. At a community level, we know that the legal system cannot be entirely held for uh, responsible for our challenges. It's not up to the justice system to try to fix us. We know that glad addressing glad you factors is not enough. We have to accept those glad you factors as trauma and help our community members find healing so that we can move on and have more productive community members. It's the responsibility of our health departments, education, employment, and other departments to change policies and make legislative changes. And that's what's going to help our communities. The priority is to develop a national core group to bring forward the issues and our common concerns for directly from our people. We hope that we can develop a national support network um, and a national platform for launching action. The 10 points that were distributed, which I don't have right in front of me, I've been carrying them all day. These re recommendations were pulled from many reports, so many reports. We don't need any more reports, any more recommendations. Let's now commit those recommendations to actions. Well, all of you. Well, thank you, all of our speakers this afternoon. Uh, Beverly, Michelle, Paula, Nigam. Um, so wonderful to hear um, community-based solutions and the empowerment of our people in being able to go back to our own system of governments and our own laws. I realize that we're running out of time, but I do have um, two questions I'd like to put to the panel. One is, why don't we just unilaterally pass slash revitalize our own laws, create our own courts and enforce our own laws? Would having our own courts not bring legitimacy? Could we not through our own courts permit reference questions on the interpretation of treaty and other Aboriginal law? Who would like to take this on? Uh, well, I'll throw some, I'll throw a few things into that um, because uh, um, I think, I think, well, we are, and I think it's just a matter of seeing what we're doing. And I see uh, grassroots people enacting sovereignty, nationhood, and uh, our rights, but it may not be, we, like if we're waiting for the Canadian courts or the Canadian institutions to recognize us, we may be waiting forever because I think it's almost, uh, as I, I started off that first story by saying, um, Canadian courts come up with Canadian decisions and in reaction this federal political leader who should know at least something anyways about Indigenous rights, although you'd be surprised of course, um, <laughs> this person said well what you're, what you're advocating for is anarchy and I said no, <laughs> what, you're, what I'm advocating for is for uh, an understanding of what the truth of the system is and the truth of the system is that Canadian systems will always make Canadian decisions. And that will naturally ostracize, marginalize, disclude us. And I'm, I'm not one that's ever saying we should give up on those systems. I'm just thinking we should see them for what they are, which is that they will always limit our rights. They will always deny, uh, marginalize, and then decenter our rights. So that why do we have to wait for those systems? Let's let. Well, I understand, of course, we're working with a relationship, and that's what I said in my talk was that. We have to understand that we're in a partnership and that we may have to compromise our values, our ethics, our, our cultures at some point in terms of that relationship. I say, don't, don't build our lives centered on that system. Build our lives the way in which we have always operated. And those are within our lodges, within our living rooms, 
within our families. And I see them already taking place. Like I see the ways that uh, our peoples are enacting justice within our communities. But it may be that we, ha we, we have to think outside of the police, outside of those, um, you know, edu even schools, for example. And it's not that we don't need those things. Obviously, I'm like, I'm not saying we should just tell our, all of our young people to give up on schooling. But I'm saying that schooling is not going to give them the answers of fundamentally who they are. They're not going to teach them. They're not going to learn about being an Anishinaabe in school. They may learn a little parts here and there. But where they're going to learn that is sitting with their grandmother, sitting with their father, sitting with their cousin, and, you know, picking medicines or, or spending time learning about uh, our language, learning the language, learning those teachings that are most valuable. And that's where the law is being enacted. So it's, it's happening. It's just a matter of seeing it. Okay, thank you. So using the terms that are out there, police and courts and laws, um, really bring a burden on us as opposed to creating our own and just using yeah. our own terminology. And that's why I think the Mama Bear right. Clan example that I tried giving, like, like there's people on the streets of Winnipeg, Indigenous women have started it. And it's a matter of going, wow, like that's happening. And it's saving people's lives. And it's working. It's working way better than policing, which is just throwing people into jail, creating more violence and death, putting knees on necks and resulting in deaths. That, that is exactly what policing produces. You, but when you've got the Mama Bear Clan, or even the Bear Clan for that matter, you've got a, uh, a restorative justice built by Indigenous peoples, delivered by Indigenous peoples for Indigenous peoples. Thank you. Any of the other panelists want to weigh in on this? Or do you want, okay, Paula? Um, one of the things that uh, we've uh, experienced in working with community over the past uh, 27 years that I've been involved in the legal system is that without the capacity building, without the community mobilization, we're not going to be able to build a strong foundation for community justice programs. One of our elders in our community, Albert Marshall, always talks about two wide seeing and being being able to see from your traditional lens and how we, our worldview, and balance that with what we've learned in contemporary Canadian teachings as well. Because sometimes those two views conflict, we have a lot of struggles and strife in our communities. Unfortunately, many of our communities, we have lost the trust and value in our own traditions. And we have to build that community capacity up. We have to build that community mobilization so that our communities are excited to try and go back to traditional teachings and traditional learnings and how we did uh, justice pre-contact. We have to build that trust. We can build the courthouses in our community, but without that trust and the community buy-in, they'll end up being empty buildings just the way the Canadian justice system um, is in our communities right now. Yeah, for sure. Thank you. I love that word mobilization and two-eyed seeing. And I think Beverly Jacobs talked about empowerment. Beverly, did I see you come on wanting to comment? Um, uh, yeah, sure. Are. I I, um, I I agree with um, um, Paula. <laughs> Sorry, Paula. Um, I I think that there does this have to be that uh, foundation because um, part of the difficulty uh, like Paula said was internally in the community we have been impacted so much uh, by uh, colonization and um, and a lot of um, the laws that we have are being practiced in our community um, ceremony um, and like uh, Nigan said, um, all of those uh, traditional cultural um, things are happening, but attaching uh, those principles um, and understanding who we are as a people through those principles. So if we have um, people who are very traumatized and trying to resolve um, it's the trauma that needs to be addressed first um, and the healing in order to even be able to come together to address um, to address the harm 
And so there's a lot of work that has to be done on, on both sides, whether it's the accused or the victim or however we want to term them, but whoever caused harm, there's a reason why they've caused harm and accepting harm. And so it's not an individualized process according to our laws, right? We have our clans, our families, our nations that are also accountable to that person. So trying, also trying to figure out how uh, everyone is responsible on, on all sides. And if, if there are uh, people who don't trust or are not aware of what those laws are, it just keeps coming around, right? Coming back around and circling back around until finally people are able to sit together and have, have that, those conversations because it's about healthy relationships. It's about establishing those healthy relationships and it takes a long time if there's trauma and abuse and violence and trying to resolve all of that first, even be able to sit together. So if you don't trust someone that's sitting across the table from you, that, that issue is going to continue to fester until, until it's addressed. Mm -hmm. So, um, and that's on every level, whether individual, as a leader, as a police officer, as a, um, as an elected leader, uh, as a traditional leader, like it, all of it needs to um, be talked about. And we have healing ceremonies. So those healing ceremonies also need to be a part of, also a part, so it, it will take a long time, or it might not. It depends on, on the community. It depends on the people who are involved. So, um, and how willing people are, are to be open to um, acknowledging even our own laws have the answers. Thank you, Beverly. Uh, I just wanna add on to your trauma and healing um, poverty because it's so hard for people to talk about all of these issues when poverty is, is so limiting and people can't really engage in talking about our own self-determination, self-government um, um, without having to deal with that. Uh, we've come to our time together and I really want to thank all of the speakers that have spoken today. Thank you so much for sharing your minds, your thoughts, your solutions, um, everybody. And I, I did want to mention that Leah George Wilson had something she had to deal with and couldn't come on. So I said I would speak in her place. She's um, like a sister to me. Um, and so um, it's nice that I can step in in her stead. Um, also, really, really want to thank the committee that stepped up and pulled this together. You wouldn't believe um, how much preparation went into this. And uh, there were many people who played a part in that. And because this is, you know, we just felt like we had to do something now. I mean, these issues are so current and, and we needed to address it. And so people were able to address that. So thank you to to the organizing panel and a special thank you to all of you that are out there. I wish I could see you. I wish we were having that personal interaction so I could see your face. I'm sure many of you shed tears and, um, you know, for the families and, and what they're suffering and what we're trying to do is, is trying to help them. And so thank you for being out there. I feel like we're, you know, I can imagine everybody out there in a, a sea of participants. So again,